Okay, so I think today I have finally, I finally have enough time to set up something I've been thinking about for a long time. So, we'll be needing some dry methanol. We'll be needing some iodine. And then we'll also need some aluminum foil. We're going to attempt to make uh, some methyl iodide and uh, this is a procedure that I first saw done by a uh, chem player, which uh, uh, if you don't know who chem player is and you're watching videos like this, what is wrong with you? You need to go find chem player's videos and watch all of them and then come back and watch what I do because they do it way better. Um, but the idea is, is we'll be trying to react iodine and methanol and uh, supposedly you can use aluminum foil as the catalyst rather than using uh, phosphorus, which is the typical catalyst for this reaction. So uh, I'll be measuring out and combining these things in a round bottom flask here, uh, placing it under reflux for a little while, and then afterwards I'll, I'll hopefully be doing a, a distillation and isolate the reaction products, and then we'll see if I can make what I think I'm going to make. So we'll see what happens. Should be all that. Then we will add the methanol. And then the last thing we'll add will be the aluminum foil. Okay. Okay, now according to what I have from Kim Player, they used 40 grams of the iodine, but they also use 50 mils of the methanol. Now, there should be much less that's needed stoichiometrically, but we're doing an excess here because this reaction is supposed to be exothermic. Is this reaction supposed to be exothermic? And uh, we want to have some excess solvent there to kind of consume that, that energy, that the heat that's generated, uh, so that the reaction isn't necessarily a runaway. So that's what we're hoping for here. A little, little more, a little more. Nailed it. <laughs> Close enough. All right. Add that to the iodine. All right. Let me get this out of the way here. Okay, as you can see, iodine goes into solution. I already have a stir bar in there, so once I add the aluminum foil, I'll get that going. And then we should be ready to go. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. When you're not really fine, you just can't get into it because they would never understand. I mean, look, you know, sometimes you just, you know, you run the great, the great experiment, and sometimes you redecorate your hot plate, and your wall, your floor, and everything around you. I mean, sometimes these things happen, you know? It's just luck of the draw. All in today's work. I'm an idiot. Cooling bath. Cooling bath is good.
Okay, so got my reaction mixture. It's been sitting forever. Uh, we're going to be doing distillation and be clicking over here on the right. And hopefully, you know, everything should go okay. Uh, I've got some uh, the chilling water cooling down right now. I don't even have the heater really going. So it'll take a few minutes for uh, that to cool down. And then once that's done, then the distillation will be on the way. We'll be here for a while. Okay, so after doing the distillation, I was left with this solid down at the bottom of the flask and I've kind of crushed it up, powderized it. It's kind of this weird brown, green color. I don't know, can't really see those very well. But uh, I'll keep this and analyze it and we'll see what it is. And then I also have my distillate. <coughs> that is here. And we'll take that and see if, if we actually made some uh, methyl iodide. Alright, here is the residue from the distillation of the aluminum uh, catalyst reaction. And I am going to run x-ray diffraction on this to see what it is. We'll see what happens. So in order to do that, you have to have a powder. So I've sieved this so it will fit in the sample holder. And if I hold up the sample holder, you'll see a free-flowing powder like a fluidized bed. And the reason that we do this is we want all of the crystalline facets to be presented to the x-ray beam. Now as you can see here, a sample is moved into the path of the x-ray beam. The x-rays are passed through the sample, scattering the x-rays onto a CCD. And what this generates is a repeatable pattern of rings known as Debye rings which are a measurement of the distance between the individual atoms that make up the crystal. This pattern is then searched and identifies the material. Now it is important to remember that this only works if you have a crystal to diffract the x-rays. No crystal, no pattern. So in the instance of this wonderful material here, after I spent the time of crushing it, sieving it, running it, the pattern I got looks like this, which means no crystal. It's an amorphous structure, which also means I can't identify it. I have no idea what this is using this method, which is a real shame because I took the time to do an elemental analysis and that told me a lot. I mean, I can see I've got a lot of aluminum, I've got a lot of iodine, and I got a lot of oxygen. However, for now, I'm gonna sit on that information and work on the distillate. So I took a small sample of the distillate and I'm adding water to it here to check and make sure that it causes a phase separation to occur, which then tells me that I very likely have methyl iodide in this sample. And you'll have to excuse the color in the sample. I didn't necessarily let it sit with uh, copper over the sample so it began to degrade over a period of time. And after letting it sit for a little while, there's a clear phase separation, which means I very likely have methyl iodide in this sample. So then I placed it in a separatory funnel and separated the organic phase, which is on the bottom. So I then had some time to think about it and I decided that I was going to analyze a bunch of this with FTIR. So this is me actually analyzing just the fresh distill it, but just to show you how it works. You take a little bit of your sample, place it on the little circle there that's a diamond crystal that's reflecting the FTIR beam, and uh, it goes through your sample and you get a spectrum. 
So it's a very simple analysis, um, but it's a very effective analysis for a lot of organic materials to get you a fingerprint that you can then search against the database and get you an idea of what you have. Now, FTIR is not the most sensitive analysis that can be done, but it's quick and it's fairly effective at identifying materials. And once that is complete, I can then search against the database. And when I do, that looks like this. And what this tells me is that my distillate is mainly comprised of methanol, which is the entire reason why I went through the aqueous wash prior. So now that I've done that aqueous wash, I just go through the same steps as we've seen before, placing the sample on the ATR, and then get another spectrum that I then search. And when I'm done with that, that looks like this. And what this shows me is that I definitely made iodomethane. I have the red spectrum, which is the reference spectrum from the database. I have the black spectrum, that is my sample spectrum. And in the bottom left-hand corner, I have a thing called my HQI, which is my hit quality index. And the closer that is to 100, uh, the better my match is. And it tells me that I have a very good match. And I definitely have this compound, according to this analysis. And because I can, I decided I was going to run an NMR. Uh, this is a benchtop NMR unit. It runs at 82 megahertz. Uh, it uses a flow cell rather than NMR tubes to analyze the sample. So you just push it through, uh, collect some of it out the other end of the flow cell into a beaker, and then switch over to your computer and collect a spectrum. And the thing that is nice about this system is I can use the sample as is. It's not required that I have a deuterated solvent. So I can just get a nice spectrum and then use that to check my material. And when I do, I get what I think is a great looking spectrum. Uh, mine is the one on top compared to a computer generated version of iota methane at 82 megahertz on the bottom. And I do plan on explaining the FTIR and the NMR better in the future, but uh, for now I think one analysis explanation per video is enough. Okay, well, I've done a bit more with this reaction, but at this point, I'm, I'm going to have to call this done, at least for this video. So this part uh, will have to be a part one. I guess I'll have to make a part two. It's mainly going to be about this gigantic question mark here, but uh, yeah, I think I've at least shown a little bit about this reaction and I have indeed made iodomethane, so that's good. Um, but for now, I guess I'll just have to say, uh, well, thanks for watching.